You see around the globe the maldistribution of wealth, the, the desperate plight of millions of people in underdeveloped countries, uh, when you see so few haves and so many have-nots, when you, when you see the greed and the concentration of power within, don't, aren't you ever, did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea to run on? Well, first of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? You think Russia doesn't run on greed? You think China doesn't run on greed? What is greed? Of course, none of us are greedy. It's only the other fellow who's greedy. <laughs> This, the world runs on individuals pursuing their separate interests. The great achievements of civilization have not come from government bureaus. Einstein didn't construct his theory under order from a, from a, a bureaucrat. Henry Ford didn't revolutionize the automobile industry that way. In the only cases in which the masses have escaped from the kind of grinding poverty you're talking about, the only cases in recorded history, or where they, where they have had capitalism and largely free trade. If you want to know where the masses are worth, worse off, worst off, it's exactly in the kinds of societies that depart from that. So that the record of history is absolutely crystal clear that there is no alternative way so far discovered of improving the lot of the ordinary people that can hold a candle to the productive activities that are unleashed by a free enterprise system. But it seems to reward not virtue as much as ability to manipulate the system. Uh, and what does reward virtue? You think the uh, communist commissar rewards virtue? You think a Hitler rewards virtue? You think, excuse me, if you'll pardon me, do you think American presidents reward virtue? Do they choose their appointees on the basis of the virtue of the people appointed or on the basis of their political clout? Is it really true that political self-interest is nobler somehow than economic self-interest? You know, I think you're taking a lot of things for granted. And just tell me where in the world you find these angels who are going to organize society for us. Well, I don't even trust you to do that. I do not believe that the fundamental value is to do good to others, whether they want you to or not. The fundamental value is not to do good to others as you see their good. It's not to force them to do good. As I see it, the fundamental value in relations to Hmong people is to respect the dignity and the individuality of fellow men. To treat your fellow man not as an object to be manipulated for your purpose, but to treat him as a person with his own values and his own rights. A person to be persuaded, not coerced, not forced, not bulldozed, not brainwashed. That seems to me to be a fundamental value from in social relations. Whenever we depart from voluntary cooperation and try to do good by using force, the bad moral value of force triumphs over good intentions. And you realize this is highly relevant to what I am saying, because the essential notion of a capitalist society, which I'll come back to, is voluntary cooperation, voluntary exchange. The essential notion of a socialist society is fundamentally force. If the government is the master, if society is to be run from the center, what are you, what are you doing? You ultimately have to order people what to do. What is your ultimate sanction? Go back a ways. Take it on a milder level. Whenever you try to do good with somebody else's money, you are committed to using force. How can you do good with somebody else's money unless you first take it away from them? The only way you can take it away from them is by the threat of force. You have a policeman, a tax collector, who comes and takes it from them. This is carried much farther if you really have a socialist society. If you have an organization from the center, if you have supposed government bureaucrats running things, that can only ultimately rest on force. But whenever you resort to force, even to try to do good, you must not question people's motives. Maybe they're evil sometimes, but look at the results of what they do. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Assume their motives are good. You know, there's an old saying about the road to hell being paved with good intentions. 
You have to look at the outcome. And whenever you use force, the bad moral value of force triumphs over good intentions. The reason is not only that famous aphorism of Lord Acton. You all know it, you've all heard it. Absolute power corrupts. Absol I'm sorry, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's the whole aphorism. That's one reason why trying to do good with methods that involve force lead to bad results. Because the people who set out with good intentions are themselves corrupted. And I may add, if they're not corrupted, they're replaced by people with bad intentions who are more efficient at getting control of the use of force. But also, the fundamental reason is more profound. The most harm of all is done when power is in the hands of people who are absolutely persuaded of the purity of their instincts of their, and of the purity of their intentions. Uh, Thoreau said that philanthropy is a much overrated virtue. Sincerity is also a much overrated virtue. Heaven preserve us from the sincere reformer who knows what's good for you and by, by heaven is going to make you do it whether you like it or not. Everything in the United States, and we still have so many impoverished people who try to get up into the world. Why is it we have this lack of money where people who can't support themselves decently and get a decent job where all these big men are up on top making oodles and oodles of money. They don't need it. They can only eat that much, eat in a sleep in a bed. And what do you the suppose bed. they do? If they don't eat it and don't, uh, don't use it, what do you suppose they, they do? Hoard it. It. They hoard it. And what do you mean they hoard it? You mean it. they put it under their pillows? That's right. No. They, they keep investing it. Investing it in That's what? That's right. Yeah. What do they invest it in? Well, in oil and everything, where, I mean, all these other people who are What are they invested in? Don't get off the subject. No. What are they invested in? Well, they invested in a lot of uh, different things that the little people need. Well, do they invest it in factories? Yes. Does some of that money end up in machines? Yes. Do those factories and machines provide ordinary working people with jobs or not? What do you suppose the productivity of this country would be and of the, uh, the wage rate would be if the total amount of capital in this country today was what it was 100 years ago? Where right. do you suppose the improvements in productivity come from except from the, re the investment by people of their savings? But let me go to your fundamental question. First place, Nirvana is not for this world. There is no paradise. Of course we've got a lot of people who are poorly off. But if you look at it over time, if you get a sense of proportion, the well-being of an ordinary people has been the main thing that has been improved by economic progress and economic growth and development. And residual, most residual hard cases of poverty today are the result, again, of a failure of government. Why do we have a teenage, black teenage unemployment rate in 30 to 40 percent? Because of two failures of government. One, a failure to provide decent schooling, which is a governmental responsibility. Has been, whether it should be or not, it has been. And second, because of a minimum wage rate, which prevents those kids who haven't had decent schooling from getting jobs at low pay at which they can earn the skills on the jobs that would enable them to rise to higher pay. If you look at the, the sources of poverty, you will find a very low, most of them are derived from bad, what I regard as wrong-headed government policies. It's also depriving people of personal liberties. Absolutely. Okay. That's a very fill good in, summary. Fill in the blanks for no, me. No, no, that's a very good summary. <clears throat> there is a very important role for government to play, but there's such a thing as too much of a good thing. And government has been growing beyond bounds. Right now, to take the simplest measure, the government spending at federal, state, and local levels amounts to over 40% of the income of the people of the country. If you go around and ask people, are you getting your money's worth for that 40% of your income, which is being spent on your behalf, supposedly, by government, there are very few people who will say yes. And they are right. We're not getting our money's worth. Much of it is... It's not merely that it's being wasted. It's that it's being wasted in a very particular sense. You're spending money to do opposite things. Here at one place, you're spending, uh, we're spending our money to try to propagandize us not to smoke. 
in another place, we're spending our money to subsidize, to subsidize a growing of tobacco. Now, what sense does it uh, make to spend <coughs> two streams of money like that? And you can go over and over again and find exactly the same thing. The government is too big. It's too intrusive. It restricts what we can do. It's becoming our master instead of our servant, and we've got to react against it and cut it down to size. Well, even if the free market system equitably works and everyone progresses an equal amount, that person who started out with less, a lesser share of the capital is still going to end up with a lesser share of the capital. That's right. And there's nothing in the free market system that's going to enable him to make up for what was a purely arbitrary deficit in the first place. And given that the kind of people who become successful capitalists do not become that way by giving away their wealth voluntarily, isn't it necessary to forcibly redistribute wealth before you can begin to operate under a capitalist system? No, it is not. The only way in which you can redistribute effectively the wealth is by destroying the incentives to have wealth. And the question is, what is the way, what is the system which will offer those people who are so unlucky as to be born without uh, good positions, what is the system which will offer them the greatest opportunity? Well, one possible way of redistributing the wealth without affecting the incentives to earn as much income as possible is simply to have a 100% inheritance tax. Uh, but Since that, that won't affect the incentives, it's only after the person's I dead your, anyway. I beg your pardon. Uh, you're too, uh, I'm afraid, uh, uh, I don't know the family you come from. <laughs> I don't, uh, but as you grow up, you will discover that this is really a family society and not an individual society. We tend to talk about an individualist society, but it really isn't. It's a family society. And the greatest incentives of all, the incentives that have really driven people on, have largely been the incentives of family creation, of family of pursuing, of establishing their families on a decent system. What is the effect of 100% inheritance tax? The percent of a 100% inheritance tax is to encourage people to dissipate their wealth in high living. What's they can't the harm in that? It. The harm in that is that where do you get the factories? Where do you get the machines? Where do you get the capital investment? Where do you get the incentive to improve technology? If what you're doing is to establish a society in which the incentive is for people who, if they have by accident accumulate some wealth to waste it in frivolous entertainment. You know, the thing is that the thing that is amazing that people don't really recognize is the extent to which the market system has, in fact, encouraged people and enabled people to work hard and sacrifice in what I must confess I often regard as an irrational way for the benefit of their children. One of the most curious things to me in observation is that almost all people value the utility which their children will get from consumption higher than they value their own. Here are parents who have every reason to expect that their children will have a higher income than they ever had. And they scrimp and save in order to be able to leave something for their children. As being a principled position to take, suppose and yet I think been, your logic requires it. Suppose it had been it. one fewer life a year. So but that the $13 per car, so that that one life instead of being 200 times, what's 200 times, uh, 200,000, and it's uh, uh, 40 million. Suppose it had been one life a year, so it had cost 40 million. Would it then have been okay for Ford not to have You can't predict that, that one life is going to be cost because of a physical defect in the car. This was a clear... I know, I know, I know, but this is, you're evading the question of principle. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm saying that... They knew look, before look, they put the car look, out that there look, was a mechanical me. defect in it. You know when you buy a car, you know that your chance of being killed in a Pinto is greater than your chance of being killed in a Mack truck. No, I didn't. I didn't know that the gas tank would rupture. <laughs> of course it is a question. Well, Every one of us separately in this room could, at a cost, reduce his risk of dying tomorrow. You don't have to walk across the street. Of course. The question is, is he willing to pay for it? And the question here he should be raising, if he wants to raise a question of principle, the we, principle he should raise is whether Ford wasn't required to attach to this car the statement. We have made this car $13 cheaper, and therefore it is one, whatever the percent is, it is 1% more risky for you to buy it.
But why? Now that. Then he would be arguing a real question of principle. Okay. Why should because they do that? that? Doesn't that interfere with the free enterprise no, system that you're not touting? At all. Why not? Because the consumer should be free to decide what risk he wants to bear. If you want to pay thirteen dollars extra for that, no. you should be free to do it. But if you don't want to pay thirteen dollars, wait. Excuse me, we have to keep it to the audio over here. So then the government does have the right to require information of corporations. No, no. Is that right? No, no. The government has a right to provide courts of law in which corporations that deliberately conceal material that is relevant can be sued for fraud and made to pay very heavy expenses. And that is a desirable part of the market, of course. What I'm trying to say to you is that these things are really a little bit more subtle and sophisticated than you are at first led to believe. There are no e you can't get easy answers along this line because your way of putting it really only doesn't really get at the fundamental principles involved. The real fundamental principle is that people individually should be free to decide how much they're willing to pay for uh, reducing the chances of their death. Now, people mostly aren't willing to pay very much. I personally regard this as very, very illogical. I see people on all sides of me smoking. Now, there's no doubt. Nobody denies that that increases their chance of death. I'm not saying they shouldn't be free to smoke. Don't misunderstand me. I just think they're fools to do it. <laughs> and I... Uh, and I know they're fools, because I quit on the basis of the evidence 18 years ago. <laughs> but that's the real issue. And if you want to be rate for it, you ought to be rated on those terms, not on the ground that you don't think they use the right numbers. Unaccustomed as I am to agreeing with Michael Harrington, I will agree in part with what he's just said. I do not believe it's proper to put the situation in terms of industrialist versus government. On the contrary. One of the reasons why I am in favor of less government is because when you have more government, industrialists take it over. And the two together form a coalition against the ordinary worker and the ordinary consumer. I think business is a wonderful institution, provided it has to face competition in the marketplace and it can't get away with something except by producing a better product at a lower cost. And that's why I don't want government to step in and, uh, and help the business community. Now, I want to go to your question about Medicare. There are many people who have benefited from Medicare, but you're not looking at the cost side. What has happened to the people who are paying for it? It isn't, we don't have a free good. It isn't coming from nowhere. And are they benefiting from it in a cost-effective way? Those are the questions. It's, it's demagoguery, if you'll pardon me, Michael, Michael Harrington, to say the people who have Medicare are freer. Of course, in one dimension. But they themselves have been paying all their lives. And have they gotten a good bargain? At the moment, they have. The young men, the young working people who are going into Social Security now, they're going to get a very raw deal indeed. Milking their own property in the marketplace. How can we all be so dumb when we give up being players in the marketplace and become citizens participating in the political process? We get taken hoodwinked by Clinton. We go for this crazy sham of Social Security. How can we be so dumb? Because it's always so attractive to be able to do good at somebody else's expense. That's the real problem about government. Government is a way by which every individual believes he can live at the expense of everybody else. That's, I'm just repeating what Bastiat said two centuries ago, more than two centuries ago. You know, the thing that people don't really understand is that free societies of the kind we've been lucky enough to experience for the last 100, 150 years are a very rare exception in human history. Most people, most of history, and at any one time, most people at any one time, have lived in tyranny and misery. And it's only for a brief period. And why? It is precisely because once you get some government program in, it may have been a very good idea, it's always proposed for good reasons, but once it gets in, it becomes a special privilege of a small group which has an enormously strong interest to maintain it. And you do not have any comparable group that has an interest to get rid of it. And therefore, the hardest thing in the world is to get rid of any government program, however badly it works. In fact, try to name any government programs that have been eliminated. I only the draft, have, well, that's not a... Yes, draft the draft is, a, is an example. It's one of the rare examples of a program that has been eliminated. One of the others was postal savings. It used to be that the 
postal, uh, postal system had a savings system, which became very popular as a result of the Great Depression. But it disappeared. Why? Because by accident, when they set it up, they limited the interest they could pay on postal savings to 2%. And when the market rate got higher than that, all the money was taken out of postal savings and postal savings came to an end. But aside from that, can you name programs that have been eliminated because they failed? And so how do we set a limit on government and keep it coming back? The only thing I can see on the horizon that offers a real chance are term limits. The system has built into it uh uh, uh, the poor remain poor and the rich remain rich, and that is an externality of the system. It is not but, built into the system at all. It has never been true. It's simply a false. If you look at the evidence, there is an enormous amount of mobility from one class to the other. In fact, there used to be a saying, three generations from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves, which reflected exactly the opposite effect. I no, it simply is not built into the system. On the contrary, there's a great deal of mobility within generations and between generations, and we shouldn't argue on the basis of false factual premises. That mobility, uh, well, l let me continue because I'm not sure it, it really has an effect on the question. Um, be because because it, it, is not, it is not immediately easy to become in the wealthy class, there are certain parts of the system which make that virtually impossible for, for the real person. Um, now, I also, I believe that this freedom, too, represents, rep represents the, the belief in equality uh, as, as opposed to, to liberty. And uh, I wonder, is it possible to build a system um, based on this equality, which I believe that many people agree in and would not be willing to, uh, to sacrifice to the liberty of Freedom from. Well, let me. I'm not going to be able to give a full answer to your question because you've asked a very, very complex question, and so you're going to have to pardon me if I'm a, if I am a little dogmatic. But I only want to suggest that the statements I'm making are not without some thought and reason behind them. In my opinion, a society that aims for equality before liberty will end up with neither equality nor liberty. And a society that aims first for liberty will not end up with equality, but it will end up with a closer approach to equality than any other kind of system that has ever been developed. Now, that conclusion is based both on evidence from history, across history, and also, I believe, on reasoning which, if you try to follow through the implications of aiming first at equality, will become clear to you. You can only aim at equality by giving some people the right to take things from others. And what ultimately happens when you aim at equality is that A and B decide what C shall do for D. <laughs> Except that they take a little bit of a commission off on the way. <laughs> by a kind of a paradox. Suppose you go around and ask people, the United States, as you know, before 1914 had completely free immigration. Anybody could get on a boat and come to these shores, and if he landed on Ellis Island, he was an immigrant. Was that a good thing or a bad thing? You will find hardly a soul who will say it was a bad thing. Almost everybody will say it was a good thing. But then I suppose I say to the same people, but now what about today? Do you think we should have free immigration? Oh, no, they'll say, we couldn't possibly have free immigration today. Why, that would, uh, that would uh, flood us with immigrants from India and God knows where. We'd be driven down to a, a bare subsistence level. What's the difference? How can people be so inconsistent? Why is it that free immigration was a good thing before 1914 and free immigration is a bad thing today? Well, there's a sense in which that answer is right. There's a sense in which free immigration, in the same sense as we had it before 1914, is not possible today. Why not? Because it is one thing to have free immigration to jobs. It is another thing to have free immigration to welfare. And you cannot have both. If you have a welfare state, if you have a state in which every, every resident 
is, a, is promised certain minimum level of income or a minimum level of subsistence regardless of whether he works or not, produces it or not, well then it really is an impossible thing. If you have free immigration in the way in which we had it before 1914, everybody benefited. The people who were here benefited. The people who came benefited. Because nobody would come unless he or his family thought he would do better here than he would elsewhere. And the new immigrants provided additional resources, provided additional possibilities for the people already here. So everybody could mutually benefit. But on the other hand, if you come under circumstances where each person is entitled to a pro rata share of the pot, to take the extreme example, or even to a low level of the pot, then the effect of that situation <coughs> is that free immigration would mean a uh, reduction of everybody to the same uniform level. Of course, I'm exaggerating. It wouldn't go quite that far, but it would go in that direction. And it is that perception that leads people to adopt what at first seem like inconsistent values. Look, for example, at the obvious, immediate, practical case of illegal Mexican immigration. Now, that Mexican immigration over the border is a good thing. It's a good thing for the illegal immigrants. It's a good thing for the United States. It's a good thing for the citizens of the country. But it's only good so long as it's illegal. That's an interesting paradox to think about. Make it legal, and it's no good. Why? Because as long as it's illegal, the people who come in do not qualify for welfare. They don't qualify for Social Security. They don't qualify for all the other myriads of benefits that we pour out from, what, from our left pocket into our right pocket. And so as long as they don't qualify, they migrate to jobs. They take jobs that uh, uh, most residents of this country are unwilling to take. They provide employers with workers of a kind they cannot get. They're hard workers. They're good workers. And they are clearly better off. If you ever want to know how people are, what people prefer, the surest sign is how they vote with their feet. And there is no doubt how the Braceros vote. They vote to cross the border with their feet, on their feet, or in any other way they can. By the, million, by the thousands and perhaps millions, for all I know. It's, illegal immigration is fascinating because it shows not only the main point I'm trying to bring out now, how interconnected are the various aspects of freedom, how interconnected is the problem of governmental arrangements for welfare and governmental arrangements for immigration and other things. But it shows a very different point that's kind of a digression. And that is how bad laws make socially advantageous acts illegal and therefore leads to an undermining of morality in general. And that if Milton Friedman had his way, it would be turned over to the market and buried under skyscrapers and parking lots within 18 months or however long it takes Donald Trump to put the structures up. It doesn't take a, uh, a governmental agency to maintain the theaters in New York. It doesn't take a government agency to maintain the, the, the museums, the art museums in New York. The Museum of Modern Art is not a government museum. It's a private. It happens to be there are two kinds. There are private for-profit enterprises and not, not-for-profit enterprises like the museum, like the opera house, and so on. Right. In the same way, if, if Central Park were not owned by the government, it never would have become the filthy place it became. You forget what happened to Central Park. Uh, we, for years, for some years, a long, long time ago, lived uh, on Central Park West when we were in New York. This was Pretty good address. During the war. Well, even, even then it was a very good it, address. It wasn't a bad address, but it wasn't particularly good. All right. But we were able to take our children down to the park and when our, they were babies and, and let them, leave them with a teenage sitter. And nobody was worried about safety. But in more recent years, until the very recent years, Central Park came to be a place where you wouldn't dare to do that. It wasn't safe. That was because it was a government park. The central principle is that nobody takes care of somebody else's property as well as he takes care of his own. Uh, I would like you to give us a, an honest evalu of evaluation 
of just how these countries got so rich so quick and that direct relationship of that to the fact that there were uh, slaves that worked free labor and the wealth that was created in this society being a direct product of that relationship and also of the colonial relationships of the Western European countries and the wealth which they bled out of the people in their col colonial domain. I will be glad to answer those questions. First of all, there's a sense in which every country in the world is capitalist. Soviet Union is capitalist. Every country in the world has large capital under control. And the real question is, of course, the organization whereby the capital is controlled. In the Soviet Union, it is controlled by the state or by officials of the state. In the second place, I uh, have been talking for an hour. I would like to talk to you for 10 hours. In a full discussion, I would certainly agree with you that capitalism is not a sufficient condition for freedom. It's a necessary condition for freedom. I never said that wherever you had capitalism, you had freedom. I never said that. I never made that statement. I made the opposite statement. Wherever you had freedom, you had capitalism. Capitalism is a necessary condition for freedom, but not a sufficient condition for freedom. In addition, you need relatively broad access to capital and a relatively free market. Again, relatively. You need com competition. I usually refer to it as competitive capitalism to distinguish it from certain kinds of systems which have been capitalist and have all of the bad qualities that you described. In the second place, because I want to, don't want to take too much time, to go to your final points. In the second place, it simply is not true that the enormous increase in the well-being of the free countries of the West arose out of slavery. Slavery was a blot on our scutcheon, there is no question. And of course, it was a disgrace to this country to have had slavery as long as it did. But if you take Britain, which did not have slavery, if you, it, uh, I'm going to go to the colonies, that's the next point. I'm trying to take one point at a time. The gentleman made two separate points. One had to do with colony, one had to do with slavery, and one had to do with colonies. Britain did not have slaves. Japan did not have slaves in the hundred years since the Meiji Restoration. Hong Kong today does not have slaves. And you ask yourself, if you want to know how people feel, ordinary people feel, about different systems, you ask how they vote with their feet. And you ask whether it's Hong Kong that has to put up police to keep people from Hong Kong going into China, or it's China that has to put up police to keep people from China going into Hong Kong. So look at the way people vote with their feet before you judge which society gives them better conditions. But in any event, In any event, let me go to the final point of, colonia, of colonies. In the first place, it's not true that the wealth or the benefits of the West derive from exploiting the colonies. The facts are against you. The reason why you say that is because it is so hard for people to get out of the notion that life is a zero-sum game. They think if one man benefits, another must lose. But in a free market, both people can benefit. 